Our next speaker is Clara Yan. She is the head of insurance solutions at Robeco. Let me introduce Clara. Clara Yan is the head of insurance solutions at Robeco, where she develops insurance analytics and advises insurance clients on asset allocation, capital management, accounting, regulatory and asset liability modeling. Recognizing the growing significance of sustainability in the financial landscape, Clara actively collaborates with insurers to integrate sustainability analytics into their portfolio construction process. Her focus extends beyond traditional financial metrics to incorporate factors such as carbon emissions, energy consumptions, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. By incorporating sustainability considerations into decision-making framework, Clara assists insurers in navigating the intricate balance sheet between maximizing returns, managing risks, meeting regulatory requirements, and achieving sustainability objectives. Clara joins from Schroders, where she served as Insurance Asset Liability Management Director, responsible for balance sheet advisory, investment strategy, and portfolio advisory work globally. Previously, she worked at UBS and Legal and General Investment Management. Clara is a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries and a CFA charter holder. She holds a Master's of Science, Financial Mathematics, from Cass Business School in London. We are all looking forward to Clara's presentation. The title of her presentation is Sustainable Investing, Charting the Course for Insurers. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Clara Yen. The floor is yours, Clara. Over to you. Thank you so much, Andreas, um, and for, for the very, uh, Thorough introduction as well. Uh, just let me get the screen set up quickly. Right. Um, yeah, so I think you, all of you have got a very extensive overview of my um, career path and history. Um, but as Andrea said, you know, my background is really, I am an actuary by training. I, I have spent a lot of my career working on the asset liability side of uh, implementing investment strategy for insurers. Um, way too many solvency to capital conversation in my career. But more recently, I did join Rubico with the um, idea of working out how we can also incorporate the sustainability um, consideration into already a quite a complex um, conversation when it comes to looking at investment strategy for insurers. So for today, what I thought it might be useful to talk about is a couple of things. Um, firstly, I'm going to discuss broadly what I think um, sustainable investing means. Um, obviously, it is a can be quite a subjective topic, and it's worth defining it um, from my perspective. And then secondly, what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the insights that we have um, glean from a global climate survey that we run annually uh, for investors um, globally and, and be able to share with you uh, how insurance company and some of the Asian um, investors are looking at sustainability. Further on from that, um, what I would like to do is to take you through a couple of case studies if we, if we have time and just talk through how we um, actually built in the sustainable metrics in a portfolio construction construction process, but taking into account all the things that we mentioned before, things like return, uh, liability profile, capital charges, your standard investment consideration, and, and also help you understand some of the trade-off that you might need to look at when, when thinking about sustainable investing. And of course, if we have any spare time left, um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, to start off with sustainable investing, I think this discussion has been going on for, for quite some time now. And, and I think um, step one is to really think about what does it mean um, for, for the different investors. I think initially in, in the kind of the more beginning of sustainable investing, um, most um, 
customers, clients, uh, investor traditionally thought of sustainable investing as avoidance. How do you avoid investment in controversial products or areas? So that's apply a more exclusionary approach to sustainable investing. This is what we don't invest in. This is what we don't do to cause harm. Therefore, we are doing something sustainable. And that, that's a nice beginning. That is a beginning to how you can address it. Uh, but subsequently, uh, sustainable investing has evolved a bit to what I call an integration approach. So there is a recognition that sustainable investing is not just a standalone concept that you can park on the side and just uh, separate from your normal investment activity. When you think about it, sustainable, sustainability, environment, social, all these kind of consideration, all impacts to our day-to-day -day life, all impacts on how the company is run. Um, if a company doesn't comply with some of the environmental consideration, it can have impact on their balance sheet, the shareholders, the um, analysts will, will recognize their environmental social policy and take that into account when they're looking at, at, at the company value. So there's all kinds of consideration that makes it into your day-to-day -day investment decision. There is a recognition that sustainable investing is more than just separating a feel-good aspect of investing. It actually has an impact on your PL. And this is where integration comes in. Really, the portfolio managers, the investment analysts will also consider this aspect um, of the company when they're doing the analysis and, and thinking through how it impacts on the economic risk and return of the company. So that is a standard investment analysis, but taking into account the sustainable factors. And then the third part of um, sustainable investing, which I feel like we are moving towards um, uh, more recently is what I call um, impact investing. That now the question is about, yes, we have taken into consideration of ESG information when we are making investment decisions Decision. We're still thinking about risk and return, but how can we generate a positive impact when it comes to investing? How can we influence company into making better decision for the future? Um, a lot of my um, discussion will probably touch on a bit of integration and impact, but I think that's probably an area that's worth um, addressing for today. I think the next question comes down to what is impact investing? Um, comes back to it. it has to be intentional. You have to have to make a, well, you don't have to, but it will be, be good if you can make a deliberate effort to target positive impact alongside your financial market. That is all great, um, but then you need to find a way of measuring impact. What is a positive impact? How do you identify it? How can you monitor it? How can you prove that you are actually generating impact in your investment. And I'll touch on that area a little bit more further down. A lot of times it does involve the use of the UN SDG in, in measuring some of those um, impacts. Um, and of course, we, from a Robico perspective, from a asset manager perspective, while we are very keen on being able to support positive impact in our investment strategy, we still recognize that we want to be able to generate return while contributing to the overall sustainable development in the future. So this is to us a combination of all three areas um, in creating this um, impact strategy. Uh, so, to step back a bit, so I've discussed um, more broadly what sustainable investment strategy means, um, and I think uh, that's a um, good starting point. Uh, but stepping back a little bit, let's let's think through what what are insurance companies today? Uh, how are they? Um, globally uh, looking at uh, addressing sustainability. Um, the obvious starting point is really in terms of the net zero um, policy. There are many insurers, some have um, aligned with the net zero asset alliance and many have also um, openly and publicly declare that they are supporting the net zero target by 2050 and, and have listed a number of insurance companies who have um, made that um, de uh, formal de declaration of their plan. And, and we, we see that um, being done quite widely across the industry. Uh, I think um, what's interesting is uh, 2050 is quite far away. A lot of people who are currently working now may not be around in 2050. Um, so there is a question of, you know, how, and also with the climate change, you need to generate impact far more early than, than 2050. Uh, so a lot of insurance companies are actually thinking through, yes, we wanted to go net zero in 2050, but actually 
the more important and more immediate question is how do we how can we implement the the short term plan, um, and this is where a lot of insurers are starting to think about how they can formalize their target on an interim term, whether that be on a um, five year basis or by twenty thirty. There are a lot of um, targets that looks at a um, a fifty percent reduction by twenty thirty, uh, and then that generates a lot more tangible discussion of how do you go about achieving that and I, I can touch on that a little bit later in, in our case study. Um, it's also hard, worth highlighting, you know, um, net zero is great in terms of uh, potentially looking at addressing the climate change part of the sustainability, but more broadly, how else can you look at sustainability in general? How can you demonstrate social impacts on the um, non-climate change impact? And this is where the UN Sustainable Development Goal is being quite widely used and recognised as a framework for defining the kind of target that you're contributing uh, from a from a social um, and, and uh, environmental perspective. Um, yes, you can see there's 17 goals here covering a wide range of area from looking at poverty, um, education, uh, building um, better city planning, um, life under the ocean, and of course, uh, climate action is, is also incorporated in these broad uh, SDG goals. What's interesting here is um, on top of um, making it a commitment to net zero, a lot of the insurance companies have also uh, set up in their corporate objective in defining the type of sustainable, sustainable goals they are also targeting as an organization overall, not just across investment strategy, but, but um, completely in, in all, all aspects of their business. Um, and here we, we have kind of created a little uh, table of just looking at what insurance company are, are targeting which goals. Uh, interestingly, not every com every insurance company are looking at different SDG. They have their own view of what's more relevant to their organization. Um, there are some trends here. For example, uh, when you're looking at climate change, I don't think there's a single um, insurer that didn't include uh, climate change into their SDG goals and, and some of the other areas um, may be a little bit more challenging to manage, for example, life under the sea, water sanitation is, is something that hasn't been included as much, but, but it gives you a broad overview of uh, a way of communicating um, across the market, you know, the, the, the type of sustainability initiatives that, that you, 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 are, you want to be committed to. And so some of these SDG goals can also feed into the investment um, portfolio that a company chooses to construct as well. And here I, I had um, also highlighted from our survey, you know, what are these, some of the, uh, how far are we going in terms of net zero commitment? Um, globally across all um, institutional investors um, here, just to give you an idea, Rubico has uh, conducted an annual survey every year. Um, and this is our third survey that we've been done doing um, for, the, for the past three years. This survey covers um, uh, 300 institutional investors globally. And in terms of AUM, uh, it, it does cover about 27 trillion dollars worth of AUM. So I feel like this is representing quite a strong picture of um, where a lot of the investors are making their commitments at the moment. So when it comes to looking at net zero commitment, uh, we, we, we certainly see um, progress um, going on every year from 2022 to 2023. Again, we're seeing more people, more companies um, going towards um, targeting a net zero commitment. There's a slight drop from 27% to 25% in terms of companies that have said they have made public commitment to net zero. Um, um, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, so what we are seeing is a lot of companies, when they have made the net zero commitment, they said, great, this is what we are doing. Um, but now that uh, we are also seeing a lot of companies are starting to dig into the details, just trying to understand what it actually means, 
how it translates into actual planning, uh, hard numbers, and they're starting to think about um, whether it, it, you know the, the level of visit, um, uh, effort that we'll make to commit to it, and and perhaps they're thinking through that some of the um, challenges that that it takes to get there, and 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 you know they they are stepping back and thinking that maybe it will take a little bit more effort than just um, making an announcement and taking it through to 2050. Um, they they're stepping back and thinking through that they may need to do a bit more work before they can make a more serious um, public commitment to the target. Um, it's also worth mentioning looking at the regional level of commitment. So looking at the Europe, North America, South and the Asia Pacific region, um, not surprisingly, Europe has been leading the way. It continues to have a quite a high proportion of companies that have already made the um, public commitment to, to net zero target. Uh, US, North America, which includes Canada and Asia, uh, is um, not has not progressed as much, but we are seeing particularly in Asia that it is catching up quite fast in terms of the interest behind um, supporting this change. Um, what's also interesting is if you look at the different um, investors type that we have surveyed, so we have survey institutional investor, wholesale and insurance company. So if we carve our insurance company as a separate category, insurance company also um, compared to our investor have made far more uh, stronger commitment to net zero, almost double the other investors showing that insurance company um, in general uh, perhaps have a more social uh, minded um, objective which ties in very well with the um, climate change um, interest there. Also within the survey, I, I just like to highlight a um, couple of areas that we notice uh, when we when it comes to um, insurers um, implementing uh, decarbonisation sustainability um, strategy. So I've already touched on the fact that um, you know uh, compared to most other investors, uh, insurers have. Um, made far more commitment to net zero uh, um, versus the wholesale and the institutional investors. Uh, we have also noticed that with insurance company, they have made far more progress in looking at how they go about making this decarbonization. So when we survey them on questions about um, how they define the carbon footprints across asset classes, the measurement of scope three emission, uh, insurers are further, further down, along the line. They are asking questions about merely just how um, we can measure carbon footprint and, and implement. They are asking questions about um, whether they um, how far what how they can define the carbon footprint in the first place, or whether they should just include scope one and two into their carbon footprint target, or how they can go about um, taking into account scope three emission as well. Um, and, and I think uh, insurers generally also shown a greater awareness of some of the data challenges that comes through um, in measuring um, carbon footprint and, and, and looking at gaps in the data as well. Looking at um, the energy sector, which was a big topic that comes through um, based on the recent uh, global energy crisis, it was interesting to see how uh, insurers are thinking about commitment to, to energy, um, both from an investment level in terms of their sector allocation to energy, as well as what they, they can do in the future. Uh, what's interesting to see is post-energy crisis, um, it, it has reinforced insurers' commitment to investing in renewable energy with 60% saying that the conviction is strengthened and, and, and kind of um, being able to um, renew their interests in, in, in that sector. I know this is an um, area where we have had quite a number of conversations, particularly in Asia, on how we can support this going forward. Um, but going back to the energy question, um, particularly with the recent crisis, uh, we also get a lot of questions about uh, whether somebody, an insurance client, should be um, excluding energy um, from a sustainability perspective versus the question of how they can manage performance against the benchmark. Um, and, and obviously, there's no um, um, simple answer to this question, but within the immediate near term, um, return is still a pressure, and one way they are they are allowing for for um, the answer to that question 
to that question is in the immediate term, allowing for more uh, tactical allocation to help the manager uh, manage the, the underperformance um, in the short term. But at the same time, I think um, there's great scope for insurers and asset manager um, as key stakeholder in, in the um, uh, energy company or gas company to be able to engage with them and work on a longer term plan on how they can um, decarbonize uh, in the future as well. Another area that we have also noticed coming from the survey is um, biodiversity. Um, so if you think about where climate about five, six years ago came up as, a, as an area that um, investors and, and insurers have been looking at um, as, as something that they need to consider. Um, and we can see that biodiversity has also come up from moving to a kind of a minority concern for insurers to an area where it's become a major concern, uh, with 51% of the insurers saying now that it is something that they would like to um, include in their um, investment po uh, policy process. And I can certainly um, relate that the um, in terms of the biodiversity conversation, um, it is probably one of the areas that we're, where we get most questions on from clients, um, from uh, looking at ways of measuring biodiversity to 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 ways of um, identifying methods of investing um, that fits in more with the um, biodiversity agenda, um, and I can also highlight that in in France um, uh, the institutional investors are already being asked to um, give disclosure on biodiversity metrics on, on their holdings as well. So we, we see that um, potentially coming through in the future uh, with, with the disclosure on this side as well. And lastly, I think um, the other area that we have noted in the survey is really on just transition to low carbon economy. So while Everyone recognizes that it's important to be able to transition a low carbon economy. It's just as important that um, the way you make that transition, the social consequences that you would generate in, in moving to a low carbon economy is also taken into consideration. And there's been far more focus on, on the insurance side in taking into account um, um, that as well in, in, in formulating their investment policy. So what I would like to do now is to take you through an example of how we can integrate some of the sustainability consideration in uh, creating a buy and maintain uh, fixed income portfolio for insurers. Um, we're very aware that um, obviously for, 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 for many of the insurance companies, um, holding a fixed income portfolio, in particular a buy and maintain portfolio, it forms a major part of their um, asset allocation and holdings. And I think one of the areas that is more specific uh, to buy and maintain and insurance investor is typically in a buy and maintain portfolio, you, you, you are looking at holding the bonds to maturity. So you tend, um, if you can avoid it, uh, prefer not to trade too often. Um, and, and therefore you take a much longer view in your um, in your investment uh, viewpoint about the, the bonds that you're holding. So the bonds that you buy today um, can impact on your um, carbon footprint in 10 years time. Uh, and, and it will be great to be able to take these um, consideration accounts at inception when you start buying the portfolio and thinking through how it will impact on your um, carbon footprint um, and, and other uh, sustainability consideration in the future. So looking at the um, sustainability um, consideration that you may want to think about in creating a um, buy and maintain portfolio, I'm going to start in the in the middle part of the of the slides and really looking at carbon footprint optimization. Um, realistically, I think essentially you're, you're really thinking about how does your um, carbon, your net zero pathway, how does your um, carbon footprint is going to change in the future? If you hang on to the portfolio and not do anything about it, I think that gives you uh, quite a lot of information that feeds back to um, whether you're making, you're able to meet your um, net zero commitment in 2050, but more importantly, um, whether you're able to meet your net zero commitment in 
in in the interim in the 2030. And I think uh, that forms a big part of the uh, portfolio construction conversation. Um, and as I, as I mentioned before, the which carbon footprint that you want to incorporate in your target also matters uh, tremendously. Obviously, scope one and two would be the preferred um, metrics based on the fact that there has been far more credible, reliable data driving um, those particular um, information. Um, but scope three um, is, is also something that can generate quite a big impact on the portfolio. And um, even though there are some questions about whether the scope three number can change um, quite a lot in the future, um, we would say that you know, clients ideally should be monitoring both and keeping on an eye on the scope free um, emission in the future. But um, based on the credibility of data at the moment, um, set their target on scope one and two. But um, and 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 also hoping and waiting for better information to come through on scope free data. The other areas we tend to see a lot of um, uh, interest in is really targeting specific SDGs. So as I mentioned before, um, SDG is a very convenient framework for setting sustain sustainability target. Um, and it is a, a, a another way of defining which impact that you want to have um, specifically within your portfolio. And, and you can also create a pop portfolio that will target um, a specific SDG, um, help you invest in company that will that, will, um, that you can demonstrate sh uh, sh uh, sh showing or um, being able to generate positive impact on their SDG um, and perhaps even excluding company that you can see uh, from, from the SDG framework that they are potentially generating negative impact as well. So we see, see definitely a, a quite an uptake in interest in that area. The other area I just want to touch on uh, is, again, a uh, question that come up, comes up quite regularly um, within our discussion with our clients. It's really on um, sovereign. So um, at a corporate level, uh, most uh, list companies would have um, been able to publish some kind of carbon footprint um, disclosure in, in, in their company reports. Um, and that, that can be used to feed into your measurement of carbon footprints on your portfolio. However, something like um, sovereigns, um, where it is more difficult to define what is a country's um, contribution uh, to carbon footprint and the um, you know how 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 you can measure that uh, in a in a sensible basis. Um, we we have created a country sustainability ranking framework, uh, which looks at um, each country's and and um, score them on their ESG performance. So um, this is an area where uh, and we use that to support our analysis um, on defining whether a um, sovereign is um, sustainable or not and, and in inclusion in our portfolio. And lastly, I think um, we certainly shouldn't ignore air, um, green bonds as well um, as another way of um, creating a portfolio that is um, sustainable. I think the biggest question around um, green bond is being able to um, check whether that it is doing what it say and creating a framework to analyze um, uh, the credibility of the green bond that is being issued as well. Um, and lastly, I, I, do, I think um, we also should also um, think about, um, as I mentioned before, um, the power of engagement uh, as equity um, owners, certainly there's been quite a lot of work being done in terms of active engagement to the issue of uh, your standard kind of engagement framework. And then and we've been very actively participating in that. But let's not forget, um, even though you are a bondholder, uh, you're looking at the debt structure rather than the equity structure, um, they, there's certainly um, influences that you can place in, in further engaging with the companies to, to create change going forward. So how do we go about doing this uh, creation of a fixed income portfolio, which is held in a buy and maintain basis? Um, and, and creating a portfolio that fits in with all the criteria. So like all actuaries or solution people, um, we build models. <laughs> in fact, we built a um, optimization model um, that takes into account uh, not just the standard bond characteristic, the things that you wouldn't naturally care about from an investment perspective. So be things like spread, credit rating, uh, cash flows, um, and, and you know, uh, risk 
behind it. So these are the questions they typically will consider when constructing a portfolio, uh, uh, but also some of the um, insurance specific characters. So ability to cash flow a match or at least duration match to liabilities. Uh, things like capital requirement um, at the end of the day, uh, I think even though that our, our target is to create a portfolio that hopefully generates a, a, a strong return and risk manage, uh, we, we also have to consider the fact that um, we, we want to make sure that we, we are, are creating a capital efficient portfolio. But on top of that, um, what we have done um, is also incorporated a lot of the sustainability information of the portfolio into our database. So things like sustainability score, things like uh, uh, our Robico created um, SDG scores, which scores uh, each company holdings with a uh, positive or negative SDG score, which give us a sense of uh, how much the corporation are contributing to each and every one of the SDG targets, um, our own uh, our, our sustainability scores, all that um, is integrated into a single database that we can subsequently feed into an optimizer and, and therefore a create a portfolio that is customized um, to each and every one of the um, insurance specific requirements. So this is how we tackle the question of how do you integrate everything together? Um, I think the answer is to be a very um, robust detailed model with bond by bond information, but I think the ability to take on investment credit information and sustainable information and be able to model together in a single platform gives us a lot of uh, powerful insights on what we can create, what's feasible, uh, what, what we can achieve if we were to go down the sustainability objective um, in, in creating this portfolio. And here is an example of a portfolio we have created. Um, in terms of target, we are looking at reducing a uh, the carbon footprint against the um, passive reference, and you can think about it really. You can think of it about it as a as a standard benchmark um, effectively in, in in this conversation. Um, we are also looking at creating a portfolio that target um, specific impacts in this. Example, uh, we are targeting some of the SDG goals within the um, framework um, that feeds into more climate change related um, outcomes of things like affordable and clean energy, sustainable city and communities, and uh, climate action. Uh, we've also intentionally creating a, a, a portfolio that generates um, zero negative SDG score, i.e. Uh, looking at our framework, um, it is not, um, uh, uh, creating a negative impact um, from an SDG perspective. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, this is still an investment conversation. So um, a lot of the questions that we get asked is, okay, we've got all this target, we want to reduce carbon, we want to create a portfolio that doesn't um, cause negative impact, we want to support certain SDG goals. What does it cost us? Is it achievable? Is it feasible? Can it be created? And more importantly, what does it mean for our return? And what does it mean in terms of our uh, risk as well? So here's an example that we have created uh, using uh, broad a uh, global uh, credit universe. Um, um, in, in, in this particular example, um, hedged to sterling. And I think from our experience, we have we have done this exercise um, quite a number of times. Generally speaking, uh, the wider universe that you can give um, to the optimizer, the more um, options that you can create, the more likely you are able to generate a portfolio that can still maintain or sometimes outperform the um, benchmark return while retaining some of the um, key areas that you would care about um, as, as an insurer, insurer, and I can see, I can, you know, demonstrate within this case study some of the um, analytics that we have generated to to demonstrate these points. Um, so, looking at the spread, um, broadly speaking, we have maintained a spread. And in fact, we have achieved a spread of slightly higher at 210 basis points versus 206. Uh, from a credit rating perspective. Um, we have uh, not only uh, maintained the rating, in fact, uh, we have managed to create a portfolio with a higher 
credit rating, um, which indicate um, from a rating agency's perspective, a higher credit quality. Fundamental credit score is a uh, internal scores that uh, the Bico credit analyst generates um, on our side. So it's our own measurement um, of credit uh, quality on a portfolio. And it's a score that our, our portfolio managers use us uh, in managing the portfolio life. Uh, and if you look at the score, uh, it has also increased quite, quite significantly. Um, meanwhile, we have managed to um, maintain the duration target that we have. And in fact, uh, we have also created a portfolio that managed to cash flow match um, against the liability as well. Overall, um, in terms of Fallen Angel, uh, we have uh, reduced the um, probability of falling below the investment grade, um, and our diversification is still maintained. If you look at the sector maximum um, on the new climate portfolio, in fact, it has a lower sector maximum score versus benchmark. Um, so at the end of the day, in creating this portfolio, we are not necessarily sacrificing some of the key considerations that you have to think about when you are creating an investment portfolio. Um, we certainly um, do look at maintaining the, the credit quality and the diversification of the exposure that you have behind the scene. Um, in terms of sustainability metrics, uh, you can see here that, um, as I mentioned, uh, zero negative SDG scores on this new impact portfolio and overall SDG score has improved significantly. Um, in terms of climate, we can measure uh, the climate impact in a number of ways on top of supporting the uh, three SDG scores, 7, 11 and 13. Uh, we can measure and we have measured the implied temperature rise of the portfolio and it's gone from two and a half degrees to two degrees. And the proportion of SBTI approved companies have, has also improved um, um, quite, quite significantly here and carbon footprint significantly reduced. Um, on top of that, from a capital perspective, we haven't sacrificed anything here. In fact, we have maintained the capital charge at 13%, which is not significantly um, different to the, to the benchmark that we are working towards. So hopefully this demonstrates that um, given a wide enough universe, uh, it is possible to construct a portfolio that both deliver returns, maintain risk, and hit some of the uh, sustainability target. Um, another area I just want to highlight here is uh, you know, we have created a portfolio um, that demonstrates that what you can do the bond that you can that you can potentially select uh, to deliver some of the uh, key return risks and sustainability objectives that an insurance client may have. Um, but the other question that we tend to get asked a lot is trade offs. So um, overall, this has been. It, it is a new initiative. I mean, at the end of that, it is a new insur initiative for, for insurance companies. And a lot, we found that a lot of times within the board discussion, within, within the investment committee discussion, there is a lot of questions about trade off. What happens if we want to tighten the capital charge? Or what happens? I guess the question is how far should we go when it comes to decarbonization? Should we, if we become more, work on taking a more aggressive approach, what does it mean on return? Um, what happens if we flex the universe to something more, more broader or tighten the universe constraint? You know, what does it mean for? For, for the return metrics. And here we have created a table which um, demonstrates some of these questions. So in terms of capital charge, um, if you were to tighten the capital charge constraint, your, your, your new optimized portfolio will, will generate nine basis points less on your spread. If you go more aggressive with your credit, credit quality, um, looking at something that is uh, uh, with a high credit rating, um, you're giving up 22 basis points. Um, and hopefully this, this gives you an idea of uh, some of the um, uh, trade-offs that you may have to consider if you want to go for a more a sustainable portfolio or be, be more um more tolerant um in terms of creating some of your your constraint and it helps drive some of the discussion um at, at a committee level. Andres, I just want to quickly check in with you. How am I going for time? <laughs> it's time to wrap up. Um <laughs> It, it um, always happens with the good presentations. There is always not <laughs> enough time. 
for the no, good no, no, ones. That's fine. I, I just want to just share this one as well, lastly, and then I'm happy to take on questions as well. Um, you know, and, and this is analysis that we do, we tend to do a lot within the uh, biomaintain question or, or portfolios in, in, in general. Um, and so uh, we, we, we here we demonstrate um, how our optimize uh, SDG climate portfolio um, has a carbon footprint that that decarbonizes over over the future um, and I think this is a very important exercise for for insurers to to look at and tackle um, I think I think that's that gives them a significant amount of information on, on how far they can go some of the feasibility question about what what they can do within their portfolio construction process um, we've also started looking at um, integrating some of the forward looking information so you think about a carbon footprint in terms of the historic it's based on what the company has defined based on the last year's annual report um, but what we're interested in is is how the companies will change their business plan and where, where they're going in the future and this is some of the analytics that we have also incorporated in our analyses. Um, I am conscious of time and I can see a number of questions here so I'll pause a little bit here uh, to give you guys a chance to to ask those questions. Right so I'll start with the second question that has been asked. How can insurers facilitate support just transition on their liability side? Would doing so dilute the effectiveness and neutrality of insurance being the risk management tool for both green and brown industries? Interesting question. <laughs> um, I think uh, it, it, liability is probably an area that I'm slightly less familiar with. I think, um, you know, my, my background has been very much uh, focus on, on, on the SSI and being um, able to identify solutions um, um, on, 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 on that perspective. Um, I think overall, you know, insurance company have been fairly uh, socially conscious in the way they define their underwriting strategy and what they are willing to um, include and exclude. Um, it, it is a complex question. I I I I think there's just more consideration needed to be made on, on that side um, um, in in juggling and balancing um, the the trade offs um, on supporting uh, um, industry that are doing the right thing and and um, being able to. Uh, do tr just transition um, sensibly. Maybe not the best answer to the question, um, but that's something that, that ought to be considered. Yeah. Then the other question, quick answer. What is your view about the recent departure of some insurance groups from the Net Zero Alliance? Um, I think, to me, I think the key thing is less about being involved in an analysis. I don't think it changes the insurance commitment to net zero. I think, I think, I think it is still there. Um, I, 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 to me, I don't think there is a so long as each company are committed to to the net zero pathway and continue to work towards it and and identifying ways of achieving it i i am still pretty positive and and, and confident about uh the insurance company role in driving the net zero change so whether yes yeah, so to me association is one part of the conversation but i'm far more interested in what they're doing at the corporate level individually Well, one more question has come in. We, okay, quick one. We are, I'm trying to be conscious of time. We are slightly behind schedule. So quick one. Why um, is it important to cater ESG efforts and investors demand for ESG portfolio? Do you think it remains imperative to also have non-ESG uh, ESG investments? In other yeah, words, I, would it be wise? Yeah. yeah, that's a fair question. Um, you know, to me, is a question of uh, do you cater for um, policyholder or investors who may have a very strong um, non-ESG viewpoints um, and therefore create a non-ESG fund? Um, I think stepping back a bit, I, I think ultimately ESG is changing the world. So whether you like it or not, um, ESG is incorporated at some level in the investment decision that that is a fact so even if someone doesn't um, actively um, uh, 
uh, label a investment as being ESG, some some consideration is being made. Um, do I think? It, uh, I think the question is whether insurers to, to sh could create a non should create a non ESG investment option for their for their uh, policyholder because I think there's a lot of non insurers um, who 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 potentially. Um, to step in and create that space. Um, I think ultimately, um, and insurer who, I, I do feel insurers ultimately, is, is it, it do exist to uh, support a collective social good. And, and from that perspective, um, you know, that it, it does align with the insurance overall objective to, to be able to generate that social good also via supporting some of the ESG initiative. Is there a loss of profit for insurers in doing so? Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's also depends on the market. So I think if you're sitting in Europe, almost everybody is quite supportive of ESG. So there's almost a non-question there. Um, if you're sitting in the US where there's more bipartisan point of view, that there may be a question mark over what you do there. Uh, so, so I don't think there's a black and white answer. I think I think it is a function of uh, which market you're in and, and your own corporate image um, objective that you're, you believe in. Um, All right. Thank you, Clara, for the fascinating insights.